I was christened Charles Peter Scott. Um, I went to India. I passed into the Indian civil service as a probationer in July 1939. I proceeded to India in September 1940 after training and remained in India until the 17th of 15th of August. 1945, uh, when, uh, 47, I'm sorry, when uh, my service, the Indian Civil Service, came to an end by Act of Parliament. The, the mood in the Viceroy's office um, about the talks that were taking place between the Congress Party and the Muslim League and Lord Wavell himself about the makeup of the interim government and where India was going to from there. Well, I think I'd better say, first of all, that I was not in the Viceroy's office at that time. I didn't, <coughs> sorry, I didn't join the Viceroy's office until the middle of September 1946 as the Assistant Private Secretary. The August discussions, from the best of my memory, which is rusty, is that By the end of July, Mr. Jinnah had said that he regarded the interpretation put upon the eighth paragraph of uh, the declaration of the 16th of June by Lord Wavell and by the Cabinet Mission was misleading and wrong. Uh, uh, he denounced them for lack of lack of candor and uh, said that he thought that they had not played quite fair with him that in these circumstances he thought that since the Congress had said that they would not join the, Indi uh, the interim government that he ought as the head of the Muslim League to have been permitted to form a government with, without saying that presumably this should be uh, with the suitable safeguards for letting the Congress come back in again if they changed their minds. The view, as I'm sure you know, was that the taken by the Cabinet Mission and by Lord Wavell was that that of the two declarations, the, Ju the June 16 declaration, only affected events and bound future events if both parties, both the major Indian parties, the Muslim League and the Congress, remained agreeable to the Cabinet Mission's plan of May the 16th of that year. They had both accepted it, undoubtedly with mental reservations, but they'd done so. Once the Congress said that they thought that the formation of the interim government, which did not would not immediately give the interim government once formed complete autonomy and in fact would mean that they had from there on it would have been a transfer of power to the interim government pending the formation of a constitution. If they couldn't get that they weren't going to join. They decided against it and said that this, these were their conditions. So that was that. On these terms I think Mr. Jinnah who had previously denounced the May 16 agreement as well, uh, thought that he ought to have been allowed to proceed and form a government. Lord Wavell told him that it was not the case. He said that he had been misled and that the cabinet mission and Lord Wavell had shown bad faith. So I suppose the uh, 
result was that Lord Wavell thought, and the Cabinet Mission also thought, I think, but at any rate, that is what the record says, that they were right to say that to form an interim government from there on, there would be no conditions. They would start de novo to see who they could get without preconditions to form an interim government to carry on the government of India until such time as a constituent assembly could be formed. And Lord Wavell approached or oh, obtained permission to ask a whole series of people whose names I can give you, uh, including Mr. Nehru, Mr. Jenner and many others, um, should be invited to become members of the Viceroy's Executive Council. As I'm sure you know, India at that time was being governed in the provinces under the Government of India Act 1935, but at the centre, the Acts of 1919 were still in force, and the Governor Governor General, that is the Viceroy in his, under his other hat as Governor General of India, British India, um, appointed his executive council. And he normally took their advice, but, and also they were not subject to the central legislature. One of the annual difficulties was that the budget put forward by the finance member and approved by the Viceroy's Council was then submitted to the legislature. If the legislature threw it out, which they very often did, um, if their reason in some cases were very good, for they probably didn't justify throwing out the entire budget, but nevertheless there were modifications which could be made to meet their, their opinions and wishes. But if there were none, it was possible for the Viceroy himself to certify the budget so that the Government of India could continue. And therefore, the Viceroy's Executive Council was not the same thing at all as the central executive responsible to the legislature, which was envisaged under the Government of India Act 1935, but had not come into effect, and which the Congress party, Mr Gandhi in particular, demanded should now be given de facto effect in Delhi in any interim government that would be formed. This was great difficulty and couldn't be accepted. So the conversations continued. Eventually Lord Wavell was, was success, successfully um, and persuaded the Congress Party that they should form a government, that they should form a government with proper alliance for Mohammedan participation, that Mohammedan participation might be, for the time being, Mohammedans members of the Congress, or gaps could be left. But the understanding was that if the Muslim League should decide at some future date to join the interim government, then those Mohammedan office holders would resign and would be replaced by, by nominees of the Muslim League, agreed with the Viceroy. I mean, they would be only um, in exactly the same way as the Congress Party's members of the government were agreed in consultation with the Viceroy. In the same way, uh, the Muslim League, if they decided to come in, their membership also would be decided in consultation of the Viceroy. Right. Mm. Maybe not what you wanted. No, no, that's fine. I just had a funny noise on the machine. Um, so what was the mood? What, what, were, what was the, the feeling of the British towards Jinnah? And that he was putting up the objections. The right. Yes. I don't think that the feeling could have been more than one of um, resignation. We had to go on. We had to get an arrangement of some kind. 
And in order to do so, uh, Lord Wavell had begun with the late permission of the government in 1945 at the Simla Conference. That had not managed to produce agreement in July 1945. It might have found agreement, some of us thought, had he been permitted to get the parties together and nominate an Indian Executive Council um, much earlier, while Mr. Gandhi and his lieutenants were still in jail. Because had this happened, when they came out of jail, here would have been a prize in front of them, something, an Indian government in operation, which they would wish to join. They would have to join, almost. Politically, they would be compelled to do so, at least to consider it very seriously. That was not possible. And uh, because the war with Japan had not, in fact, been won, uh, I think the government at home felt that they must have considered that uh, this was something they couldn't agree to. And uh, so he, Lord Wavell had to wait until July 1945 before it was possible to have, hold the similar conference, which, uh, were, by which time the Congress Working Party and all members of it who had been in jail, as well as others, were out, had had time to collect their wits, and um, could not see in front of them any immediate goal which they wished to achieve other than the quickest possible departure of the British government, or the British from India. And uh, it, it, the details of the similar conference are well recorded and, and well known and uh, it didn't, uh, Lord Wavell stopped it because he said he couldn't get agreement. And he was quite, I mean, and that was the case. After an autumn of a good deal of conversation and thought about this, the cabinet mission came to India in April 1946 and was there until July. And despite failure to get agreement, the proposal of some most interesting and extraordinarily, in my humble opinion, well-constructed um, proposals for the formation of a constituent assembly from which, with where the membership would have been roughly one member of the assembly of every million of those in the subcontinent, uh, elected by the provincial legislatures and nominated by the or otherwise by the Indian states. Uh, it was to produce a constituent assembly of that kind, which once it had made its constitution, it was thought, it was proposed, that that constituent assembly, acting for all India, would make a treaty with the British government for the orderly transfer of power. Meanwhile, and during that time, it was proposed that the Viceroy's Council should be continue under the existing constitution and that the parties, the two major parties in India, plus with some representation for the scheduled castes and the six, would govern India in the same way under the 1919 Constitution Act as had the government of India had been carried on hitherto. But once the Constituent Assembly had concluded its labours and the Constitution was in existence and in force and had been approved, then that Constituent Assembly would become a central legislature or after elections there would be a central legislature which would produce a government. This proposal by the Uh, cabinet mission failed to obtain approval from the two major parties and uh, it was very plain I think it became plain at any rate Lord Wavell in his diaries makes it quite plain that it was his belief and I've never heard it argued against, seriously argued against that Mr. Gandhi wished at that time and saw uh, it, to end 
British responsibility for India at the earliest possible moment and if he could obtain the agreement of the cabinet mission to granting the Viceroy's Executive Council reformed the position of an absolutely independent government he would have got what he wanted because he could have thrown everybody else out and that this would have produced chaos that India would have become indefensible that it would have had no money and <laughs> would have was a matter of indifference to him uh, they, he was not an administrator and he was neither, neither that he was an extremely shrewd political negotiator and politician but um, he the consequences of what he was doing were not apparent to him and apparently not entirely recognized by all the members of the working party of the Congress However, the since the, I say all this only to show that the meeting of the checks in the political dialogue between the Viceroy as the representative of Her Majesty's government in India and the government of India in himself as the Governor General under the 1919 Constitution um, that, that he should meet checks in these talks which had begun in 1945 and that he met another one in the summer of 1946 when Mr. Chenna said that he wasn't uh, accused him of bad faith and published a, diff uh, a very very um, disobliging letter to the Viceroy accu so accusing him and published it before the Viceroy received the letter uh, it was indefensible but it was something which I think those doing the negotiating had come to recognize was likely to happen at almost any time and uh, there it was there was another roadblock the only thing to do was to regroup and get round it or get over it and uh, so I I don't think that I, I think those who were involved my observation was that they they knew what they were dealing with they had their own opinions as to the reliability or otherwise of the main protagonists and of their staffs and assistants that they thought it was possible if not to get an agreement at any rate that they thought that they should go as far as they possibly could to get agreement without jeopardizing in a serious in any serious way the good government of India and if the parties did not wish to proceed well that produced a new situation which would have to be dealt with on its merits can I just interrupt there the Viceroy's office was one of resignation. Well, it wasn't in the Viceroy's office. I can't say. Yeah, okay, but the, the mood within, the mood among the British administrators or whatever. You couldn't even say that, really, because an awful lot of people. Mm. Sort of, <laughs> I, I uh, would something like this be all right? Um, mm. My impression was that those nearest the talks could have would have regarded another setback with resignation in the sense that they did not expect to succeed uh, they would have been delighted had they done so but uh, realized that there, there were very great difficulties in the way of either party agreeing when I'm sorry, uh, either party agreeing to a settlement when it would require very considerable sacrifices from both of them. In effect, India, the Congress party hoped to govern India by right as the principal party of the Hindu majority. They were absolutely opposed to the formation of Pakistan. Their own departure to jail in 1942 of the leadership 
left Mr. Jinnah with three years in which to propagate and obtain support for the idea of Pakistan, which when they went to jail was something which perhaps was no more than a negotiating ploy. By 1945, it was almost, my impression was that it was almost set in concrete as far as many Mohammedans were concerned. I'll just again stop you there. Any surprises? Were, were, was anybody surprised by that? By who was actually in the interim government? Not that I heard. Right. Hmm. And can you remember the actual signing in of, that, of the interim government? It was sworn in on the... Can I, can I ask you to say the interim government was sworn in? Was sworn in on... Sorry, turn that on. Yeah. The interim government was sworn in on the 2nd of September, Monday the 2nd of September 1946. And uh, at that time I knew very little about it except what I'd heard and followed. And my department in the Government of India um, was not really affected by it because the Secretariat of the Governor General Public, as, I, as the department I was working in was called, um, was a constitutional department which was responsible directly to the Viceroy. On the other hand, part of its work was the consideration of mercy petitions from convicted murderers in India who, having had their appeals rejected by the courts and petitions for mercy rejected by governors, were given, still retained, a last chance of having their convictions set aside or their sentences commuted to life by the Viceroy. And those cases all came from the provinces through the Secretariat of the Governor General Public. And for a period, they were, it was my responsibility to see that they were in order, to see whether there were any grounds for further correspondence with the provinces concerned, if there were any omissions in the dossier and so on that were plain upon the face of the record. And provided that was not the case, the recommendation that mercy should not be shown was usually made by me as a junior for approval by my secretary to government who would then have put it up, if he thought right, would put it up to the Viceroy. If uh, under the new arrangements Mr. Zahir Ali, uh, the new law member, was somebody to whom I would have to put these documents forward. Uh, provided he was willing to see reason, it didn't seem to me that I was in any difficulty. Because you were saying in September you moved into the Viceroy's office, so in September you actually moved... I didn't move in as Assistant Private Secretary to the Viceroy until the late in September when Charles Rankin, then the APSV, who was a soldier, um, left to go back to the bar in the United Kingdom. And what was the... Can, can you remember how it, what it felt like to be in India at that time, given that there were the, the riots the intercommunal riots going on, that there were all these negotiations going on, that you could see that the end of the British Empire in India was coming to an end. What was the mood like? What did, what did you, how did you all feel? I suppose to me as a young man, it seemed that I'd gone to India in the belief that at the very limit I might get 20 years. By then it was quite plain that it was not to be 20 years and that if it was another two that would be as far as we were likely to remain. The, and that the Indian services, not people like me but uh, my seniors, who'd served India well and most of whom had had almost no leave at all for something like eight years, 
uh, were not likely to be able to last much longer. And uh, without some decision being made, either that we would continue in India and accept that we should have to have, as Lord Wavell pointed out in his famous report to the cabinet of that winter, uh, that we should need considerable reinforcement of British troops in order to be quite certain that law and order could be maintained and that the Indian Army, if it, those units which showed any dis disposition to mutiny or be difficult, could be controlled. And we should probably have had to decide, the government would probably have had to decide, decide to retain power in India until such time as a new generation of politicians who might be willing, in fact, constitutionally to take over the government of India grew up. Now that's a long time, that, that would have seen me out. But the chances of it happening when demobilization was well advanced in Britain, when anything like a reinforcement of two or three corps to India, which would have been required, was quite impossible. It wasn't, there was no possibility of it happening. So to hold India as we had in the mutiny in 1946-7 was I think uh, something which was you would have had to say, you would have to rule out. It, it was it was not a, a, a in any sense a viable course of action. We couldn't have done it because we couldn't we hadn't the power to do so. The other thing was that it was it was apparent that India was had a large educated population. True, that was probably not much more than about 5% of 400 million at that time. But that's a fair number of people who at any rate were well enough educated to understand at least what a local autonomy meant. And very many of them had quite a good idea or could learn what the government of a great continent might entail. When you've reached that point, in a foreign possession, it's time to go. And can you, I mean, do you remember that broadcast? Would you have heard that broadcast yourself, where he announced? I think I did, yes, as it happened. Yes, I think I did. I think my own personal feeling with it was that Yes, it was a step. Let's hope it'll lead to other steps. You couldn't be sure that it would do so. And uh, it was a line, obviously, very well worth trying. And uh, as, as I say, my observation was that those who'd been closest to the talks throughout were convinced that they had to go on trying. And if they could get an Indian government in office it was also hoped that power, as almost always it happens, would convince at least some of those in the cabinet, or government as the case was, the executive council, that um, the practical difficulties of governing India were real and that communal difficulties were astonishingly intractable and that it was their business to try to calm these difficulties and to resolve them, to get over them, and that they would carry the direct responsibility for doing so and no further, would, no longer would it be possible for them to say that it was somebody else's fault. Um, Do you remember those diff the difficulties? You know, you talk about the difficulties and the communal problem. Hmm. Do you remember that those difficulties, the riotings? Oh, very much so. And uh, the papers were full of it. And I think the Indian press, which uh, at that time was perhaps not as responsible as perhaps it's become since, um, seemed to be having a field day. They were 
a little inclined to print sensation for its own sake, quite regardless of the consequences. And in a country where, well, which contained places like cities, such as Kanpur, where, where perhaps the population were, I believe, 50% Mohammedan and 50% Hindu, very roughly, um, almost anything would spark off trouble, which was then because the two sides were strongly divided. If there was sufficient excitement, you would get rioting and possibly deaths. So that I think the press were behaving extremely um, irresponsibly. And um, I think people recognized that that was the case. That uh, and trouble was not something that we were was unknown to the administration. It it happened. The bad spots were known. The people who dealt with it knew how. And uh, the um, it was only when it happened on a very grand scale. Ask the army for assistance. Generally speaking, the armed police and the regular police dealt with it between them. Where were the worst places? I suppose the worst places at that time, or the worst outbreak was Calcutta in uh, August 1946, on the 16th of August, uh, and apparently the government, the Muslim League government in, in, in Bengal, uh, didn't anticipate it. At any rate, they declared a public holiday on the 16th of August, and everything started with that. And what was everything? Well, the Calcutta massacres, as they were called, there were several days of rioting in which 5,000 people were killed, so the official count said, and something like 15,000 wounded and injured. And um, it was a, a very nasty business, and I believe my memory is, though I speak very much subject to correction, that something like 11 battalions of troops were eventually employed to restore order. Now that's a, a very serious and expensive business. And after that, Mr. Gandhi departed to Calcutta, and I believe then and later did excellent work in trying to keep things calm. However, the communal feeling, which was strong, my impression was that you could see it building up and it started coming west and the next series of bad troubles, massacres and the like took place in Bihar and the government of the United Provinces, as it was then called, now Uttar Pradesh, took extreme measures to ensure that it shouldn't come across their borders, and eastern, the eastern UP remained quiet. But later on, I think sometime early in October, but here again my memory is very poor, um, there was an outbreak near Mirat, quite close to Delhi, where a fair in a riverbed um, blew up and the inhabitants of a village in which I and many other and several others had been shooting and near which we'd been shooting duck uh, only a few days before um, all the inhabitants were slaughtered and put into one well and that had to be stamped on very hard indeed and uh, both by arrests and and the like, and uh, it was fortunately sufficient, and we did not get that kind of real, really appalling communal rioting in Delhi until the transfer of power. But you said it also spread to other places as well, didn't you? You mentioned Patna. Well, that was in Bihar, you see, the oh. capital of Patna. Mm. Oh, right. mm. What? Because you you would have served under both 
Lord Wavell and Lord Lord Patton. Patton, yes. What was your view of both of them? Did you prefer one to the other? I suppose, as a, a public servant, you accept your masters who are appointed. You try to serve them as well as you can. And uh, it's re with respect, it's not for junior officers like myself, as I was at the time, to have opinions of, about the competence or otherwise or wisdom of two men, both of whom carried responsibilities during that time of India, in India, which were very great indeed. And I think others will have to judge whether they discharge them well or ill. Coming back to the, um, the, the interim government, Yes. did you know any of the people in that interim government? Met them, yes. Mm. Uh, the, um, no, I mean, they, they, were, they were ministers of the government, and when I was in the Viceroy Secretariat, um, one inevitably came in contact with them, either um, meeting them or taking them into meetings and that sort of thing, but I didn't have business to do with them. Mm -hmm. um, if I may digress a moment, uh, put very shortly, the Secretariat of the Viceroy for negotiations with the Indian parties leading towards a transfer of power was in fact the Viceroy's private office. The Government of India individual officers advised the Viceroy but the keeping of records, the drafting of communications to His Majesty's Government and the like were done through the Viceroy Secretariat and its ciphers. So that the Viceroy's private office, uh, to a degree possibly unsuspected here, was involved as the kind of, you might say, the Secretariat for these negotiations. And my two seniors. Uh, Sir George Abel and Sir Ian Scott, um, they were in effect the secretaries to cabinet, if you like, or to the viceroy in his capacity as a negotiator, as a governor of India, and as in fact the government of India, as I've said under the 1919 Constitution Act, um, was the personal rule of the viceroy. <laughs> But uh, as an officer on leave preparatory to retirement, who by special permission of the Prime Minister was allowed to <laughs> um, run the Viceroy's private office, or rather the Governor General's private office as it became, because both, by pure chance, both the Viceroy's private secretaries, who were British naval officers, were both ill. And on the day of the transfer, they both went down. And uh, I. Um, I happened to be there because I was waiting for an aeroplane and had to get home and uh, because I was functus officio, I, I was, uh, as I say, an officer on leave prepared to retire. <laughs> that was it. But um, Lord my Patton put it right with Mr. Nehru who said yes, I might continue to function, so I did. And uh, as the, it made no difference to the government as I was on full pay anyway. So uh, the, uh, that's what I did for, during that time where business was not very brisk. Uh, really. What was, what was your memory of Independence Day itself? Well, Independence Day, the 15th of August, I was for India, which Delhi was in, of course, at the time. Um, it was a splendid, fine, hot weather day. And uh, the impression I had, which I'm sure was the impression of everybody else who was there, was of enormous happiness, joy by the pound, quite extraordinary. And I, of course, having no position at all, was able to borrow a lift from somebody 
to go down to the Maidan at the, the parade ground at the bottom end of the vista in Delhi, if you know Delhi, and, and uh, uh, down beyond the um, First World War, War, War Memorial, down the bottom there, where stands had been set up and a great flagpole put up and so on, and the Viceroy was going to come past and would be received by Mr. Nehru and his cabinet, and the flag of India would be broken, and the great parade was already in place, and so on and so forth. It was a carriage drive down to it. He having been to the legislature in the morning, which I had no part in, as I had no job by then, because I, my service had been abolished by Act of Parliament, so I was sort of in limbo. But I was able to get a lift down, and I walked part of the way to try to get as near what was happening as I could. The crowd were extremely good-tempered. They were very surprised to see uh, me walking about. I don't think they, they just thought I must be cracked <laughs> to, be, to be doing it. Um, the police were doing their best to keep us all in line, and then one of the stands collapsed, and so we all had to turn to and pull out some people who got pinched and hurt and one thing and another, and lay them out in the sunshine. Um, where I hope they were all right. The rest of us were rather interested in what the Viceroy was doing coming down to see us. Well, of course, the chances of his getting to us seemed then slight. Uh, the road was full of people. People were terribly happy, but they really weren't paying very much attention. And uh, the troops drawn up on parade were standing at ease and waiting to be called to attention the Viceroy's arrival. And there were people climbing up the... <laughs> the sepoy's legs, there were babies <laughs> all over the place, there were people picnicking almost between the ranks, and uh, it was really a very disorderly performance. And uh, it <laughs> the officer commanding the parade, an Indian brigadier, must have had the devil of a job getting anybody to come to attention at all. You could hear nothing. And um, anyhow, the Viceroy approached, the parade was drawn to attention, but no further words of command could be heard. And so, he drove down towards the saluting base, and I was standing somewhere near it, and um, a good, tough Punjabi policeman came and beat us all on the head with a lati, and I fell over with two other people, my arm round their necks, and we all sat down on a very hat of fat Hindu gentleman behind us. <laughs> and we all said, come on, uncle, and pulled him up. It was, it, it was extremely um, hot and sweaty. By that time, I'd come clean through the suit I was wearing. I was simply wet through. And uh, those around me were equally cheerful, but um, uh, pretty wet too. Anyhow, we sat on the ground under threat of being banged on the head again by the policeman and uh, watched. And the Viceroy eventually appeared. By then, the Viceroy's carriage, as you've seen from the pictures, was... Uh, full of refugees and by the time he got to the saluting base Mr. Nehru stepped upon the step of the carriage to salute the Viceroy and uh, was quite unable to get back onto the ground again. There were people under his, under his feet and all over the place and so in the end as there was nothing to be done and nobody could hear anything um, the Prime Minister was invited to get into the hood which he did and he sat in the hood at the back of the landau <laughs> with Lady my Viceroy in front of him and uh, the wife of a friend of mine uh, who, was, who had fainted or something of the kind had been picked up and put in the back too was sitting there and uh, so they drove away no parade, no salutes, no nothing and nobody ever, as far as I remember broke the flag out until some time later when there was a great church well, it was very, you know, good tempered but so forth and uh, that was that so I then had to get myself back to Viceroy's house. Well, of course, there was no transport, and I walked. And it's about a couple of miles, I suppose, and it was a very hot walk. I can imagine. Bad temper. I've never seen anything like 